Hi, and welcome to the last episode of Spotlight on UNBC for this millennium. My name is Rob Van Adricombe. There have been a number of major developments at UNBC recently, and we'll report on all of them this month. The UNBC athletics program got a big boost recently when the men's and women's basketball teams played their first official games ever in the BC College Basketball League. There was also an important survey which showed that UNBC graduates are getting work easier and faster than the graduates of other BC universities. And we'll start this show off with a reaction to the annual Maclean's Magazine ranking of Canadian universities, which shows that UNBC is on the way up. All that and more is coming up on this episode of Spotlight on UNBC for December 1999. It isn't every day that UNBC gets good exposure in the national media, but that's exactly what happened a few weeks ago when UNBC again scored top marks in the annual Maclean's Magazine ranking of Canadian universities. To do well in the Maclean's rankings uh, brings your university to the attention of a national audience. Uh, so there's no question that it is the most powerful marketing tool for universities in the country. McLean's breaks their ranking down into three categories. UNBC is located in the primarily undergraduate category, and this year we moved up to eighth place. We've moved up from nine to eight, but remember last year we were tied for ninth. So in a way, you could say we've moved up from nine slash ten to eight. It's a, it's a fairly significant move. And, uh, and we're also, uh, you know, uh, west of Manitoba, the most highly ranked small university. I think that's very significant for us. Significant as well for the students who are counting on UNBC's growing reputation. McLean's annually surveys more than 4,000 high school counselors and corporate CEOs as part of the ranking exercise. And those people identified UNBC as a leader of tomorrow. This year, the ranking showed that UNBC is attracting better students, and the value of scholarships rose to more than half a million dollars. The library was ranked number one for the proportion of its budget that goes to new acquisitions. I'm pretty excited to see UNBC uh, move up in the rankings again. As a new university, we're working hard on getting our name known throughout Canada. Um, pretty good magazine, a lot of people read Maclean's, and uh, to see an increase or an improvement over last year should uh, hopefully spark some people's eyes. Even in the Chinese community, I think the, the parents are really concerned about where the kids are going for university and stuff, and they want to have visuals. And McLean's is a good visual, and they even have it in like the Chinese edition, and a lot of people purchase that to, to read that, and the parents get excited, and they start telling their kids, oh yeah, so-and-so university's in there, and stuff like that. So they, they feel more comfortable if it's like recognized. Yeah, exactly. It gives, do you think it gives the university credibility that it wouldn't otherwise have? Oh, definitely. I mean, there's lots of reasons why we shouldn't do well in McLean's, but we do well. And we do well because of the quality of the faculty. We do well because of our success as a research institution. We do well because we're all so serious about building a top-notch university and put tremendous resources into the library, for example into building up the infrastructure of what is going to be an outstanding university for years to come. UNBC's position on the national stage was strengthened even before McLean's came out when the university hosted a national summit on research in rural health. More than 100 people attended that conference, which was the first ever national summit on how research can provide answers to the pressing health issues in rural areas. What this meeting was, was a, a group of individuals who previously had not really interacted. They'd, medical doctors tend to meet amongst themselves, nurses tend to meet amongst themselves, government policy people tend to meet amongst themselves. This meeting brought together all of those sectors and from across the country, and it was wonderful to see. At the news conference wrapping up the summit, Max Blau and co-chair John Wooten of Health Canada announced the outcomes. Number one, 
A report will be presented to the federal health minister outlining a research action plan. The delegates are also setting up a website and email list that will allow better dissemination of research results. In my experience, we've wasted an awful lot of paper in putting together reports and other statements of findings that often sit on shelves or are used as doorstops. Uh, this really reduces their utility to the people that they were intended to help. Uh, I think we need to find far more effective ways of uh, getting these research findings back to the community so that they can apply them to the problems that they see. Getting research results back to the community is only one part. Delegates also spent time talking about how to make communities more involved in the research that will provide them with answers to their critical health issues. For Vanderhoof doctor Stuart Johnston, research has a direct effect on health care in smaller communities. There's probably a very good example going on at the moment. We're looking at um, the outcomes of doing appendectomies in rural hospitals. Um, however, we don't have the statistical tools available to us to uh, legitimize this information. And we're now going to have to go and find a statistician to help us put this into a decent research paper. Now I could see UNBC working interactively with those of us in the field who have projects that would Im ultimately impinge on health care for everyone in the rural areas. Um, and in doing so, UNBC would have a real feedback into the areas. If you could show that what we're saying, namely that we actually do provide a valuable service at a, um, with, with excellent outcomes, then it means that this service will continue to be provided in rural areas. As you've quite correctly said, the anecdotes are legion, uh, but no one has bothered to sit down and try and tie these up and make it uh, into useful information. Conditions on barriers to implementation of research. There needs to be a better balance in terms of uh, researchers doing research because they feel there's a need for the research to be done on the issue uh, with that uh, with, with researchers being uh, tools for communities to uh, to come up with the uh, answers that they need in order to make healthy uh, choices about their health uh, uh, outcomes. Community involvement is fundamental and is characteristic of much research at UNBC. A health research booklet produced by the university contains 50 research projects and many were initiated by the community. One example is a research project on fetal alcohol syndrome. In this case, UNBC researchers are teaming up with women who have lived through addictions and pregnancies. And the result will be strategies to encourage healthy pregnancies that come from the real world. We've taken grassroots women who are living in our community, um, researchers from the university, people who are working with Northern Family Health Society, and put together a project that can start to move, take the stories and um, create, create the solutions. And the kinds of things These are the women who have had the experience themselves of FAS. And we've been working together as a group since June, I guess the funding yeah. came through. June right? 1st was our first And meeting. have been meeting, um, we had thought we'd meet, you know, maybe once a month. The group <laughs> said, no way, every week. So three hours. it's been every week for pretty much three hours. Yeah. And the social action piece here is what keeps these women coming. Uh, that as well as, as the commitment to uh, telling other women their stories and having other women shorten that recovery journey and in so doing then prevent FAS. Fetal alcohol syndrome occurs in children when their mothers drink alcohol while pregnant. The effects are wide-ranging and include mental and physical deficiencies. The brains of those children simply don't function the same as healthy kids. And it's something these women don't ever want to see happen again. Do you think you can make a difference? I'm here. I, it's been like, I never thought I'd be here. Like people in my community thought, like, this is Vina. No way. <laughs> She's there. <laughs> and this is how far I've gone. So I'm doing good. And I'm hoping to help a lot of people, like out there. And, like my future goal is to be a, a drug and alcohol counselor. The circle that they've created, of the research circle, 
um, has Im really given them a sense of being able to do something they never thought they would have been able to do. And if they can do it, and they can tell their story, and they go out into their back to their communities, which are their other circles, and they get other people to talk about their stories, that might also then give those people the ability to know that they can do things they never thought they could do as well. It's clear research does make a difference to health, and UNBC will follow up the National Summit with a Provincial Health Research Conference in January. It's appropriate on this last episode of Spotlight on UNBC for this millennium that we focus on some high-tech developments at UNBC. After all, the next millennium will likely bring even more technologies that will enhance the learning environment at universities everywhere. When you think high-tech at UNBC, you probably think of the science labs or UNBC's fiber optic system. Now this is probably not an area that comes to mind. Now sure, libraries are full of books, which aren't exactly cutting-edge technology, but the library is also full of these. Computers provide access to millions of articles, and with the cost of journals like these rising 15% last year alone, technology gives a new university like UNBC the chance to compete with older and bigger libraries. The students, when they come here in first year, are quite flabbergasted because um, they've never seen anything like this. UNBC librarian Neil Campbell is right, but it isn't only new students who are in awe of the resources available via this new technology. Here's how it works. From the main UNBC Library World Wide Web page, students can select databases from a wide array of different subject areas. And then they choose the database they want and search for a particular topic. And what you do is you um find a query. I'm going to do fish farming here, if I could get this done right. There. And I'm going to search on that. And I've got how many? 76 records that contain fish farming. A large number of those 76 articles we pulled up on the screen would simply not be available in the UNBC library. Now the databases often have the full text of articles so students can complete a good portion of their research online. Um, there are a lot of papers which you can't get from our library because, well, it's expensive to cover a lot of journals. Mm -hmm. And the interlibrary loan also costs you a bit. It takes a while too. But in a few seconds you can have an article if you use the academic full text delete. Um, right now I'm writing a paper on uh, subarctic and arctic anthropology, specifically trade. And I just wanted to supplement one little section about obsidian, because obsidian's traded a fair bit. And the fact that obsidian is quite, uh, quite sharp and used today for uh, plastic surgery. And here's a text, uh, here's a an art journal article about it, old scalpel for new faces, and I just uh, typed in obsidian and I got something like this. I'd actually been searching for an article like this uh, using our regular library databases and haven't found anything. We are equivalent to larger institutions in Canada in terms of electronic resources that we have available. Where there's nothing that most institutions have, uh, the larger universities that we don't have. Yeah. So it gives a uh, equality of access to students and researchers in the north that they otherwise wouldn't have. Yeah. And if without the electronic access or digital information, we couldn't actually do that yeah. without costing millions and millions of dollars more than we do now. So it's really a level playing field. Um, we've had comments from regional students doing graduate studies that they feel in the same position as regards their research as they would if they were in a major urban center at a larger institution. That they, there's nothing they can't get that they want and there's nothing index they can access that they can't get this way. So it's actually um, a very successful approach for UNBC. More UNBC students will have an opportunity to learn and apply new technologies thanks to a $60,000 contribution from Xerox Canada. The money will allow students to earn a salary while working on projects such as creating course web pages or working on multimedia and graphics. Technology moves so quickly and the best way to keep pace with this is education. So in order for us to be able to partner with programs like this and build education, we are really positioning ourselves for the next millennium. Positioning ourselves with leaders who understand technology, use it, 
and go out and teach other people how to use it. The Northern Edge Xerox team will involve up to 20 students over the next three years. Students will be selected from any degree program and will work on computer projects while they continue their studies. The program will especially involve Aboriginal students like Ron Carey of Smithers. The projects are like incredible. You can do whatever you want, basically. Your projects are, you can, it's all learning. I love web graphics. I just want to get into um, doing neat designs and, you know, making things do different things on the net. Technology also plays a big role in student recruitment and public awareness. On that front, UNBC has a new web page that gives people the chance to see the campus without actually setting foot here. A QuickTime program allows viewers to get a 360 degree panorama of the campus from the central courtyard. And there's also an interactive aerial photo. By clicking on any building from the aerial photo, viewers can be taken inside for a close-up view. The campus tour is accessible from the main UNBC homepage at www.unbc.ca. As we look forward to the new millennium, UNBC researchers are interested in knowing what people think the future will bring. A new millennium survey will provide answers. Some of the 8,000 surveys that were sent out are now being analyzed, and this survey was the first ever attempt at reaching out to Northerners to gauge their opinions on issues like economic development, politics, First Nations issues, education, and the quality of life. The results of the survey will be outlined on the next episode of Spotlight on UNBC. The business program has always been one of the most popular offerings at UNBC. The business students have recently formed a society and are helping to raise awareness of the program and its students. Well, what we're trying to do with Bugs is we want to build a connection with the community. We want to get the UNBC business program out there. And the career fair is your opportunity to um, meet potential employers, network, um, build a connection, um, make an impression on them. The business students obtained official society status earlier this year and hosted an event on campus to commemorate the achievement. Since then, they organized a career fair for students with displays and presentations. And in the new year, Canfor CEO David Emerson will be the keynote speaker at a fundraising dinner. We're up yeah. from nine companies last year to 20 this year and it can only grow. Last year we had all the groups speaking at once and we've broken it into the majors. Um, this after, in the morning we had accounting and then finance and in the afternoon we have marketing, international business and general business. Uh, those are all mixed together but hopefully next year we'll be able to get specific companies for each of the majors. From business to politics, two UNBC students were very busy in November running their campaigns for the local elections. UNBC students Dan Milburn and Gerald Christie both ran for spots in the recent election. Dan for a spot on council and Gerald tried his luck on the regional district. Both were unsuccessful but the two environmental planning students learned a lot. I think the biggest thing we've learned is uh, listening to the people. Um, without doing that we're not going to get anywhere. Um, uh, there's a lot of different concerns in a lot of different areas. Uh, everybody's viewpoint is different and just as important. And so, uh, yeah, I think that's really been lacking, uh, not to speak for Dan, but certainly in, uh, in my area, regional and district uh, in general, is that we have to get back and get the power to the people once again. Yeah. And that's what the planning program also instructs us on, on better ways we can actually get meaningful public input. Mm -hmm. And so going out there and, 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 and actually doing it and trying to have better public input processes in this community, I think is a real essential thing. Yeah that really needs to be seen either way, whether we get on council or not, that needs to be done in the future. Enrollment keeps rising at UNBC and the total number of students taking courses at UNBC this year is 3,400 up from 3,200 last year. The number of full-time students is up considerably over provincial government expectations. When UNBC was created, a conservative estimate of student numbers by the year 2000 was less than half of what UNBC currently has. The higher than expected enrollment is putting pressure on the facilities and services at UNBC. The UNBC athletics program has resurrected its annual holiday tradition. Operation Red Nose is a designated driver program and a major fundraiser for athletics. Operation Red Nose volunteers are dispatched a total of 10 weekend evenings in December to coincide with holiday festivities. The volunteers drive people home in their own vehicles and are followed by an escort vehicle. 
Last year, the program contributed to lower drinking and driving stats in Prince George. Impaired driving is a 100% preventable crime. If people simply will not get in their cars for whatever reason, uh, number one, they're afraid of getting caught and the fine and paying the penalty. Number two, someone has offered them a ride home uh, from their, wherever they've been drinking. Uh, number three, Operation Red Nose volunteers are going to drive them home from their season's uh, Christmas party or New Year's party. Every time something like that happens, you, you, you can assume that you've prevented an accident or saved a life. You know, and so it's so important to, to just be doing everything you can. To find out more about Operation Red Nose, call 960-5888. While many students at UNBC are in their late teens or early 20s, that by no means captures the entire student population at UNBC. A 72-year-old student recently completed the requirements for a master's degree in social work. And Phyllis Parker is definitely a role model for other mature students. I went back to school as an adult with a family. Uh, I went to grade 13 to, to get English before the uh, college of uh, New Caledonia opened. And, and I found that there's an enrichment between mature students and, and young people. They accept you. And I don't feel very different to them until it's going up and down stairs. And then I feel a little different. But I just want to take the master's because it was here and then the research came later I, when I understood, you know, all that was involved in a master's degree. And then because I had worked uh, in a treatment center for 13 years, uh, I thought not many people know what goes on in a treatment center. So my basic question is what goes on in a treatment center? I thought people would be interested in that. There's lots of other faculties here to explore. What's your next degree? Uh, <laughs> First Nations, Gender Studies, Anthropology, I don't know. They're all interesting. UNBC currently has just over 1,100 alumni, and many are already making their mark in the real world. Recently, a province-wide survey found that UNBC graduates from 1996 found work faster and are, on average, making more money than the 1996 grads of any other BC university. The survey shows that the 73 UNBC grads from 1996 had a pretty easy transition to the workforce. In almost all categories, the UNBC grads scored higher marks than the other university graduates. For example, more UNBC grads are currently employed. A higher percentage say their degree program was useful for getting a job. 80% say they would take the same program again, and 93% say they're satisfied with the instruction they received at university. Business grads Mark Stafford and Don Gabori say the survey confirms what they've known for a long time. I found it very easy. I went, I put one resume in, and uh, I got a job from that resume. When I, when I got my first job and started working it, uh, the people that I worked with would come and ask me if I knew anybody that wanted a job at a bank or whatever and uh, because I was a grad in the finance program we got I had all these names I gave them the list of names and they hired that list of names it was pretty much just like that when we first graduated in 96 being the first grads um, of the business program it was a definite advantage advantage to us because like you said there wasn't a lot of people around with the same qualifications that were willing to stay in Prince George and work um, with more and more grads, it's definitely getting filled up. It's definitely a little, little tougher. But at the same time, with us working out there, people are getting more educated on what, we, what skills we have, what we learn, and what we have to bring to a business. It's true outside of the business world, too. Kathy Marchuk is a graduate from geography and is now teaching elementary school. I think everyone's done really well for themselves after graduating. Um, a few of friends of mine are overseas doing different things, working in the UN and, and going to school in Portugal. I know one, uh, my friend John is, but um, I think they, they did a very good job of, of finding that transition from school to work. They've all found jobs, no one's out of work or anything. So, you know, a lot of the friends from high school didn't go back to school and they're just not where they wanted to be eventually. And, and I'm definitely where I want to be and on the right track. The emergence of varsity sports has been one of the biggest stories on campus this year. First, we'll have a report on a recent rugby match and then we'll turn our attention to the history that was made on the basketball court. The University College of the Caribou visited Prince George recently and were trounced 
29 to 5, and the win helped UNBC to a 3 and 3 record in the first half of this season. University stature has uh, picked us up a lot, and being able to get intercollegiate games and being part of the intercollegiate league has been a big part of our success. We're doing really well with it. We've got good coaching. Uh, we've, we've got structured practices, which is a big difference from uh, running around and just playing, playing touch rugby uh, during, the, during the weekends or whatever. It's been great. From the rugby field to the pandemonium of the basketball court, the Northern Timberwolves men's and women's basketball teams kicked off their first official seasons in the BC College of League in front of a packed house. It was the culmination of years of preparation. It's uh, been four years in the making. It's for myself being at the university for eight years now. This, this is the pinnacle of the time that I've been at the university. Others were also having the time of their lives. The fans were incredible and everybody got into the spirit. Even the president and the chair of the board of governors had their faces painted. We're going to go the whole face? Oh, no, we're not. Okay. No, we're not. <laughs> Does wash off, yes, it does. <laughs> oh, Leslie got it done. She got We're trying to get better student involvement here. Train. We're uh, going to have buses out to every varsity game this year from, from the residents, and uh, we want to get everyone involved. Almost everyone was involved in this game, including these student boosters. Right foot in, right foot out, right foot out, right foot in, right foot in, and you shake it all about. There was a lot of talk around from Nugs, that kind of thing about, you know, promoting school spirit, uh, building what we had last year. So I thought, hey, let's actually do something with this. And we formed a club and uh, got a bunch of guys and gals together and started this up. A lot of spirit, a lot of students out here. Uh, that's what makes those kinds of great traditions at universities. Uh, my last uh, long-term appointment was at the University of Western Ontario. It has 41 intercollegiate teams of one kind or another. And that is a very significant part of the tradition of that university. As for the basketball tradition at UNBC, the inaugural games were very entertaining and showcased incredible talent. One of the most significant baskets of the night went to Prince George native Nicole Ross, who scored UNBC's first points ever in varsity competition. Despite some great shots, the Northern Timberwolves came up a bit short on this night, dropping the game by a few points to the University College of the Caribou. Round two, as the men's team was next, again the opponent was UCC, who went to the national championships last year. But despite the tough competition, the T-Wolves started strong. UCC came back and took the lead into the second half, but UNBC fought back. At one point, the score was tied, but UNBC could not finish off the Kamloops school and lost a heartbreaker. But for the players, it was only the first game in a long season. Kent Bergstrom grew up in Vanderhoof and played for the University of Alberta before coming home and suiting up for UNBC. It's just exciting to more exciting, like love playing in Van Hoop. U of A was awesome, it was basketball heaven over here. But this is uh, something, it's just, it's something totally different that you couldn't, you couldn't ever get at U of A. This is the idea of starting out new, all the fans coming out, uh, just to, uh, looking at the potential, all of, it's, it's really neat, it's, it's awesome. Thanks for watching this episode of Spotlight on UNBC. Have a great Christmas and good luck in the year 2000.